Um, okay, so um, I've already mentioned that uh, Chairman Williams has placed a strong emphasis on supporting financial innovation here at the FDIC since arriving, but another one of her initiatives has been uh, transparency and promoting trust through transparency by traveling and listening uh, to stakeholders around the country. And for this lunch session, we're sort of marrying the two. Uh, she's agreed to come back and spend half an hour with us discussing questions that you all provided to us in advance. We received many great questions uh, reflecting a diverse set of issues, so she's gonna address sort of the five themes that come through most frequently. Um, before I, before I uh, 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 bring her to the stage, uh, I, I recalled one housekeeping item. I've received several emails from people wanting um, access to the papers that The Economist have presented today. Our plan is to post those on our website after the conference, so we will do that, and we will also send you, you an email when they are ready, so that, that will be made available. Okay, now, without further delay, uh, please join me in welcoming Chairman McLeans. So this is what happens when all of the good speakers get to speak before lunch and after lunch, and you're stuck with the chairman at lunch. Um, so we have collected, I, I basically asked the staff, I said, you know what, we always tell others what to do, and, and uh, you know, we always go through the formal uh, public and notice comment process and request for information to get to solicit feedback from people about um, how we should be looking at things. And I said, this conference is our opportunity to actually solicit questions from the audience and see if we can provide some answers or at least engage. So we have collected the questions that have come to us uh, before the conference. We grouped them in five categories, and I'm supposed to do the David Letterman five, four, three, two, um, and then we decided, you know, that's too cool for a regulatory agency. Um, so we, we, we're going to go the old-fashioned ways. I have the cards here with the questions, and uh, if we have enough time at the end, uh, we'll take questions live from the audience as well. And so one of the questions we got, uh, and this is where I go, number one, okay, number one, the rise, of, oh, it's on that screen, the rise of fintechs, how has the rise of fintech, uh, fintech affected competition for financial services and among banks? And um, I'll give you an example. Um, when I took this job, I, I, I said, you know what, I really should get the community banking experience. So I drove about an hour out from DC. I'm not going to tell you in which direction. Um, there are two directions from DC, two different states. And I drove to a community bank. And I, I went there in and I said, I would like to open up a checking account. And they greeted me. They were very nice. They asked, who do I work for? And I said, FDIC. And they said, are you in compliance? And I said, maybe. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, and they said, what do you do for the FDIC? And I said, I'm an attorney. Uh, so what does that mean? And I said, well, I look at regulations. Um, hmm, okay. Uh, and then they gave me my checking account card. And they said, your debit card will be mailed to you. And then they took a piece of paper, they typed it up and laminated the card and gave me the card. And I remember looking, um, last time I looked at the laminated card was a Blockbuster card. <laughs> And so I thought as I was driving back for an hour, and it took about an hour and 20 minutes on the way back to DC, as I was driving back, I was thinking, how do community banks compete uh, with fintechs and technology and the development of technology and the investment in technology they need to compete? And the FDIC did a community banking study uh, and survey back in 2012, and there were some updates in 2015 about the economies of scale and how it's very difficult for community banks to compete, uh, especially when it comes to the investment in technology and uh, keeping up with the regulatory landscape. So the, the main component of the competition that we're seeing between uh, fintechs and banks, and then among fintechs, banks, and, and non-banks, is uh, consumer experience, right? We have come to the point where people are very, very, uh, very much so not patient, right? You apply for something and you expect it to appear, and and uh, I remember I was filing my taxes, and you know you have to input a code in order for you to be able to file electronically, and they send you the code, and literally in the span of, uh, I, I think it was a nanosecond, I was like, where is my code? Um, and, and of course it came and it was all 20 seconds. Um, but the truth of the matter is that we have become very impatient. We want delivery now and fintechs are able to provide more agility than traditional banks because they're able to work through the, uh, through their algorithms and technological innovations and look at, look at, uh, at ways and, and, and pros proceed much more quickly than banks. So the question for us is how can we encourage banks and create a regulatory environment where they can compete with that. And one of the focuses uh, that we have at the FDIC, and I'll talk a little bit later about the FDIC Office of Innovation, is exactly that. How can we enable fintechs 
to be um, uh, to be good partners to banks? How can we enable competition within banks in this consumer space to encourage more innovation? And how can we, on the regulatory side, look at our regulatory framework and not look at the past century, but look at the century ahead and think about are we are we putting regulatory obstacles to uh, the ability of banks to innovate and develop in this space? Um, so in general, we, we are in favor of fintech partnerships, uh, and there are just questions on how best to do it. And we're also in favor of developing technology and being entrepreneurial on the bank side, inside the bank. And the question is, again, how do we enable banks to paint this space uh, uh, wisely? Um, th there is also an issue of reducing compliance burden on some of these community banks uh, in particular so that they're able to compete. And technology has, um, I call it the great equalizer. It has an ability to actually help community banks compete more effectively in a space where without technology and, and new developments in technology, they would be complete outliers. But also we need to focus on how do we reduce risk that comes up with all of this in our system. And that would be, I'd say, that's a third prong of our approach. How can we do all of this while making sure that the system is safe and sound and that we're not increasing uh, risk to financial stability? All right, so number two. It worked. With a nanosecond delay. Um, have, um, we ha how have requests from fintechs changed the FDIC's approach to new charters? They have not. Next question. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, we have a statutory mandate. This, is, this, is, this was a trick question, and I think uh, some of you were very tricky. This is basically a question, are we looking at the ILC applications in any different way, industrial loan corporations? So let me just translate the, trans the question for you. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is that we have statutory requirements we have to meet. And then we have, and they're good old statutory requirements, whether you are a bank applying for uh, deposit insurance or if you're an ILC applying for deposit insurance. And um, as we look at those statutory requirements, and our regulatory requirements, we have to focus on safety and soundness of the institution for which we're looking to uh, approve the deposit insurance application. And there are two things that we have to focus in uh, specifically that basically for the purposes of the fintechs uh, put a lot of question marks. Um, and one of them is capital adequacy. We have a regulatory requirement that at the end of year three, you're supposed to have 8% capital at your entity. And uh, for fintechs, 8% uh, capital, some of them have translated to mean equity. And capital does not. If I had a hashtag to show you this, capital doesn't... Hashtag? No, nothing. Okay, never mind. Uh, capital doesn't equal equity. And, and working through the capital adequacy issues um, for fintechs um, has been uh, uh, rather interesting and, and cumbersome in some cases. And the second component we have is profitability. And I spent enough time in Silicon Valley as a young lawyer uh, in the early 2000s that I know that I met a lot of millionaires on paper, mops, and they couldn't even buy a car. Uh, so the, the issue is how profitable are these companies? Uh, and can they show profitability that would give us a peace of mind as they're applying for ILC charter and getting deposit insurance that we're not exposing, uh, introducing risk to the system? Uh, we have uh, attempted to be more transparent about how we do uh, applications for the novel insurance at the FDIC, and uh, we're posting more data through our Trust Through Transparency initiative on our website, and we're also looking at ways how can we improve our process where it's uh, more consultative. We can go, we, we have started the preliminary filing process at the FDIC where we're entertaining a lot of questions from fintechs and uh, uh, the novel banks on how, um, how the, the application should be structured and how it looks. Uh, and, and what it should look like to become uh, substantially complete. Uh, so we're trying to make, make some progress in this area, but the truth of the matter is that capital adequacy and profitability are requirements we uh, need to be very focused on, and uh, we'll proceed with the ILC applications as they come in. We have a statutory mandate to do so, uh, but they have to satisfy the requirements we have on both the statutory and, and regulatory side. All right, number three. There you go. How can the FDIC help enable fintech partnerships with banks? We can't. Next. No, I'm kidding. The the uh, we can actually. The the, the issue is um, what do the, what do fintech partnerships provide for banks? And in a lot of cases, they provide the ability of banks to be agile 
to be able to access markets and customers that they may otherwise not be able to access on their own. They provide the ability for banks to be more efficient in how they both reach consumers and how they offer products and services. So the idea here at the FDIC, and I'll talk about the FDIC um, Tech Lab uh, in, in a second, the idea here is really for us to focus on what can we do to encourage these partnerships in a responsible manner. And people talk about um, sandboxes, people talk about pilot programs, uh, partnerships, et cetera. The idea for us is uh, to enable the culture, both within the FDIC and outside, of uh, working with different fintechs and different banks on how can we structure our regulatory framework where innovation is encouraged, whether or not it happens inside of the banks or outside in partnership with the fintechs. And that's something we're focused on. Um, we're also working with our partner agencies to harmonize uh, our regulatory framework so that we're all looking at innovation and, and, and the ability of banks to innovate and fintechs to partner up with banks in a similar uh, fashion even if Joseph Auding will not admit that I'm a better regulator. Uh, the, uh, we're also um, looking at third-party risk management, and this is a huge area of concern as banks are looking to partner up with fintechs. And the question I often get is that um, your third-party uh, risk management guidance basically says that I have to know my third parties, third party, and their third party. And the truth of the matter is that we, there are several ways uh, to introduce risk. Into, the, into a bank and into the financial system. And um, the question is, how far do we need to go? How far, how deep do we need to go to be able to a, um, assess really what the risk is to a financial entity and then the broader system? And so this is where the fintech issue becomes um, all the more volatile for the purposes of our analysis. Um, do these fintechs have the compliance regimes in place that uh, give us a sense of security um, that once they partner up with a bank, we will know how they're managing um, their cyber, their uh, uh, PII issues, professional, uh, personal identifiable information, uh, just general uh, safety and soundness risks. And this is where I think a lot of fintechs uh, are still struggling in this space because they are not directly regulated by us, but by virtue of our third-party uh, risk management, they basically feel that they are indirectly regulated by us. And what I found to be very helpful as I talk to banks and fintechs is that a lot of banks are actually very um, encouraging of uh, fintechs allowing them to uh, look into their compliance system so that the banks can vouch for what the fintech is doing. And I was in California a couple of weeks ago talking to fintechs exactly about this. How do you partner up with banks and are we in your way? And if we're in our way, how are we in your way? And does it make sense to be in your way? And are we regulating banks vis-a-vis -vis the fintechs appropriately? And one of the things that uh, scenarios that was laid out for me is that we want to comply. This is the fintechs. And we want to be able to partner up with as many banks as possible. But understand that uh, banks are asking us to send their compliance staff and look into our compliance systems and have access to our data. And then as we look at, and, and to us, it looks like a takeover in a way. And so finding that balance where the banks are encouraging fintechs to have the structure in place where we, the regulator, uh, will look at, at the bank and the third party and say, okay, everything is good, check the box, and yet not, uh, not providing um, instability in the system by feeling uh, that the fintech is being taken over by banks, uh, compliance staff, or that there, it's data or trade secrets or business models are being exposed uh, is, is something that we're actually struggling to find the right balance um, balance for. Uh, next question, number four, is how will the availability of data change banking? And so I joke at the FDIC that data is the new capital. But every time I say that joke, my capital markets team looks at me and I think they're trying to figure out what Basel III uh, risk weighting they should assign to this new form of capital. Uh, that is a joke. The, uh, uh, but that phrase, I feel, it captures the importance of data. And data truly is, uh, is, the, new, you know, is, the, is the new currency. Uh, if you have data, if you have access to data, you can change the world. And, and that's something that's not lost on the FDIC, right? We get into the issues of uh, open banking. I get asked quite often uh, about open banking in the UK and whether or not that's the right approach here in the United States. 
Um, I believe some of that would require legislative changes, and, and um, I, I wouldn't say that I'm uh, inept in, in saying what those are, but I certainly shouldn't wait in those territories. From a regulatory perspective, though, we need to take a look and, and see how is this data uh, being shared, what are the consumer privacy concerns, and what are the competitive and anti-competitive landscapes that we are encountering as we look at, at who owns data, how should the data be, be served, and, um, and who should, be, should it be available um, and under what circumstances. And if you really think about it, if you made all of the data available to everyone, you would have a tremendous amount of competition which would drive the cost uh, down and pr produce probably more efficiencies in the system, but you would increase uh, risk of cyber security incidents and privacy uh, theft. And so the question for the regulators is, uh, you want to encourage innovation, you want to encourage uh, competition, entrepreneurship, a good thing. But how do you balance all of that with basic safety and soundness and risks to the financial stability and consumer protection laws and regulations that we have on the books? And that's something that we'll be exploring at the FDIC in the months to come. So I think there's a subset of this question, um, which was also focused on um, what, is, um, what is the FDIC? How much data does the FDIC have? We have more data than would fit this building. And the, one, of the, one of the purposes behind our Trust Through Transparency initiative, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that you all crash the website today. My IT people are probably saying, please don't. Uh, going to our Trust Through Transparency website to see all of the types of data we have put out, and we're constantly updating and offering more uh, for folks to take a look at, and it's a part of our both transparency and accountability initiative at the FDIC. Uh, we have a lot of data and we use them for uh, supervision, we use them for consumer research, we use them for general research. We have um, tons of failed bank data which we're looking to uh, make accessible to researchers in the coming months. Um, and, and really, um, the, the, whatever data we can make available to the public at the FDIC, uh, we would like to make efforts to, to make it publicly available as much as, as we are allowed to under the privacy laws and the um, confidential supervisor information concerns we have. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that if we make this data available from the FDIC side, that perhaps the researchers and folks in this room and, and outside are going to be able to take a look at how the agency is doing things and, and utilize that data to help us be better. And I'm hoping that the private companies uh, will realize there is benefit in making more data publicly available than not. So I'm, we're hoping to lead by example uh, as much as we can at the FDIC. And number five, why is the FDIC the best regulatory agency in town? <laughs> Never mind. What role will the FDIC Tech Lab have? So uh, if you, hopefully when you went to our website to register for the conference, you, you got some snippet someplace on the website about this uh, lab we're trying to create. And um, let me just be very frank. Uh, most of the agencies are creating some form of a lab, some, fo some, some form of, of this tech um, corner lab, sandbox, call it what you want. And the easiest thing for us would have been just to say, hey, we have a lab, let's call it whatever we're going to call it, put a person on top of it, and we're good to go. And that's not what we're trying to do at the FDIC. What we're trying to do is basically create um, a disruptor in the regulatory world. And um, as you can imagine, regulators are by nature, very, very, very risk averse. And so being able to step out on, on the limb and say, the world is changing, and our regulatory framework um, was founded and established pretty much in the last century. There were some tweaks done in this century, but we're talking about the FDIC, an 85-year-old agency, and most of, us, uh, most of our rules and regulations were put in place uh, pre-2000. There were some tweaks post-2000. There was Dodd-Frank that brought us new regulations and new powers. And, but truly, uh, as we look at the world of banking, as we look at capital, liquidity, uh, as we look at safety and soundness, um, and in some cases even consumer protection issues, we're looking very much so to the past. And so for, for uh, the FDIC, the question is, um, as I mentioned earlier today, it's, it's going to be almost impossible for us to be uh, leading and on the cutting edge of technology by virtue of us being who we are, a federal regulatory agency. But we do have an opportunity to take a look at the regulatory landscape and say, are we enabling innovation and are we enabling the 21st century banking or are we holding it back? 
Are we holding everything back in the last century? And so the lab, the purpose for the lab is really to both inward and outward engage and think through technological issues and how can we encourage innovation both in the way the FDIC looks at and supervises banks and also at how can we uh, enable banks to partner up with fintechs? How can we enable banks to actually innovate on their own and create um, um, agility and uh, the, the ability in the system, in their systems, to meet consumer demands, be on the cutting edge of, of financial services, um, and be able to offer uh, offer products and services that uh, both fintechs and um, and non banks are now able to offer uh, with greater speed and efficiency. And th that also um, uh, the idea behind the lab is also uh, um, partly um, uh, attributed to my concern that we have created our regulatory framework, uh, especially since the financial crisis, uh, where every bank is very concerned about doing anything. No matter how large you are or how, how small you are, you're very concerned about being an outlier, being out there, being being the unicorn. And that has resulted in a lot of the banking activity being basically shifted to non-banks. Uh, and if you take a look in the mortgage servicing, mortgage origination arena, 10, 12 years ago, among the top 10 servicers and originators in the country, we had banks among the top six or seven. And now it's the exact opposite. And I'm not making a value judgment whether or not that's good or bad. But I am making a judgment that um, we have uh, minimized or reduced, I would say, the, the risk in the, in the banks, but we have not necessarily reduced that risk in the financial sector. So more we are able to get a grasp of what's happening outside of the banks, uh, it, it, we have a better sense, it'll give us a better sense of how the system is working and where we need to focus. Um, and as Secretary of the, of the Treasury this morning mentioned, we, we know what the old crisis looked like. And um, I can't help but pitch the FDIC's publications on uh, crisis and response. It's it's a phenomenal book. Um, and I, I maybe we have can we can we provide some to the audience? Do we have any? We can. Well, anyhow, on demand we can provide you book. It's glossy and it's good and it just dawned on me we should have been like. If we were a business, we would be like having big billboards with this book out there. Um, so it's it's about how the FDIC looked at the at the last crisis and and responded to it. Um, and and uh, as as we look at all of that, uh, we need to focus on not the last crisis, but what could be the crisis ahead. And we can't do that if we're looking back and and treating our regulatory framework as the framework from ten years ago, looking at the same idiosyncrasies that that caused the financial crisis. We need to focus on those. We need to be cognizant of the safety and soundness issues and consumer protection. But we need to be forging ahead and thinking straight through uh, the, the issues that are coming up in both banks, non-banks, fintechs, and seeing what is the role of the FDIC and the other regulatory agencies, and what what can we do now? to make sure that we can answer those questions in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, luckily for me, my term ends in 2023. <laughs> All right, with, with that, I think we have come to the bottom of the, of the five questions, top five questions, and I would just like to open it to the audience. As I know from this morning, where's Aaron? You can't ask any more questions. Your 12 seconds have been, go have been revoked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Joe McWilliams. Um, well, congratulations on this conference and, and on your endorse, endorsement of uh, FinTech. Here is my question. Uh, obviously, FinTech and technology is a very logical, uh, analytical approach uh, to data. Um, is the FDIC also open to the other side of the spectrum, which shows that under certain circumstances, banking customers actually make um, banking decisions that are not necessarily analytical. Uh, they are more intuitive, and um, as we saw in the area of behavioral economics, those decisions are often the wrong decisions. So the question is, Considering fintech, would the FDIC also be willing to look at studies in behavioral economics that shows irrational decision-making by banking customers? 
So if I didn't know any better, thank you. If I didn't know any better, I would say, are you Dan Ariely who, dra who wrote uh, Predictably Rational? Uh, the, uh, we're looking at all of that. We have extensive consumer research. Uh, and, and we know that uh, consumer decisions are driven from a number of different perspectives. Sometimes it's the need, some, sometimes it's the perception, um, and then, then there are many other reasons. Uh, but we need to be, as an agency, open to considering different ways of how consumers are approaching these products and, and how they're going to look at uh, what the banks and the fintechs and the non-banks are going to offer to them. And then also we need to get a little bit of a sense of, of, of even more so than we do now, as, as to when they make those decisions, um, even if they're not perfectly rational decisions, how, do, how does their decision making affect the ability of the companies to offer products and think through kind of a greater systemic risk type of issues? Uh, you, you don't want everybody going to um, uh, choose a consumer product just because it you know, has the lowest rate or it's, 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 uh, it makes the most sense at that time if the product is really risky. So you, we're focusing on all of that. And, and, uh, Speaking of data and all of that, we have uh, we have a solid research department uh, at the FDIC. I have to uh, praise our folks uh, because they, they constantly look at the studies and uh, look for papers to publish on, on similar issues. Uh, we are a deposit insurance agency. Um, having said that, we focus quite a bit in the consumer research space. Thank yeah. you. I'm the other Dan. I'm the Dan who wrote the study on money anxiety not on the irrational decisions. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, thank you, Chairman. Um, Josh Silver, National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Uh, you were talking about the FDIC application process, and particularly for fintechs. And um, I want to ask a question. There's been a few applications from fintechs to become full-fledged banks, both through the FDIC and the OCC. Um, and uh, NCRC, we're an organization of 600 community organizations around the country. We care deeply about the Community Reinvestment Act and obligations to serve all communities and financial inclusion, which you share as well. Uh, and when you open up an application for a FinTech, we, they, it says, invariably, our assessment area is our headquarters cist city, that's where we're going to have our CRA responsibility. And fintechs are nationwide lenders um, or nationwide service providers. And you cannot um, appreciate how frustrating that is for CRA advocates that, that my, my responsibility is only going to be in my headquarters city. You're undergoing a CRA reform process with the fellow regulators, and assessment areas is, on, is one, one of the uh, items on the table for discussion and for reform. Um, do you have any thoughts for us today about how we can choose states and metro areas and rural areas that the fintechs should uh, indicate a responsibility for in their application? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and as you mentioned, the CRA is going, uh, going through the rulemaking process right now, so we don't... Um, we have been careful not to comment on the specifics until the three regulatory agencies actually have the, the something on paper that, that reflects a, a, a proposal. Uh, but I can talk generally about how we're looking at, uh, uh, frankly, digital banking channels. And now you have banks that are very much so just digital, or you have banks that have more digital presence than uh, on the ground presence in terms of their branches. And, 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 and the question becomes, what is their footprint? Right and and what who are their communities and it's something that um, you know I spoke about the importance of branches in the past. Um, I, I branches still serve a purpose. The question is you know what purpose and how can that be uh, um, allocated appropriately for the purposes of the CRA as we move forward with modernization. Uh, the uh, with respect to the to the fintechs. Um, um, I don't know that we have um, approved uh, applications necessarily thus far where those concerns have not been addressed. And um, we, we certainly work with the fintechs on as they approach us about, hey, we're thinking about the Nova Bank or acquiring a bank or a national charter or uh, a, um, an ILC charter. Uh, we certainly tell them to focus on exactly how are you going to meet community needs. And I can tell you that I personally have had discussions with different people coming through my office about, hey, we're thinking about all of these different cha uh, charters and options for you know, our entity. And I said, hey, whichever one you pick, just remember this, that the, you will have to figure out how to serve your communities and it will, you'll, have, you'll have to be able to satisfy that requirement on your application to get approved to the extent that you come for deposit insurance with the FDIC. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I have a question. I'm Heather Eastap with Hunt and Andrews Kurth, and I want to revisit point three, enabling fintech partnerships and referencing the regulatory framework where innovation is encouraged. 
What can community banks expect on exam and how are exam staff being trained on innovation? So uh, we are, um, we have a lot of boots on the ground. So the FDIC has 89 field offices. Most of our workforce at the FDIC, we have 6,000 employees is the examination workforce. Uh, we take about four years to train examiners. And uh, focusing on innovation is um, not necessarily new at the FDIC because banks have been innovating and, and doing innovative stuff for, for ages. Uh, but focusing on innovation in a way that uh, our regulatory framework supports innovation and doesn't penalize banks for innovation is um, slightly, uh, somewhat of a new angle at the FDIC, right? Because you want to encourage banks to think outside of the box, and you want to think, you want to encourage them to basically think about how can they get more consumers? How can they? We like consumers in banking. We like, we, we prefer to have bank consumers versus unbanked and underbanked consumers because we believe they can create, uh, um, um, it's, it's a path to wealth building. We believe it's a path to, to pro prosperity. Uh, and, um, you know, so long as, as banks are treating consumers well, it's, it's a better place for them to get their financial products. And so from our perspective, uh, the question is how can we get to our 4,000 plus examiners to, with exactly that message that think, think about a bank that's innovative innovating with um, a, a due deference to the business decision making. You know, we need to focus on consumer protection. Is what the bank is offering going to harm consumers? Uh, does the bank know what they're doing? And what we found out is that a lot of times, banks are struggling to attract new customers and bring them into the fold. And there are two basic, two basic ways to do so. One is to um, acquire another entity, another bank, or a portfolio, or, or um, um, set of assets and try to bring those consumers over and expand banking relationships with those, which is very, very costly. Uh, you can also try on that side to, to lure consumers from other banks by offering several hundred dollars for opening a checking account or a water bottle. I don't know what's the latest. Um, or you can basically try to reach the unbanked, underbanked folks who have fallen out of the banking fold and try to bring them back in with innovative products and services. And so I think on both sides, we need to focus on what is the role of a regulatory agency, right? And uh, on, the, on the side where you're trying to bring new customers into the fold, they will, we, banks will have to offer them some types of products that are different than the products that the, those customers are currently getting from non-banks, right? And the question for our examination force is how exactly to look at that and preserve consumer protection uh, and safety and soundness. And so we have done extensive training with our examiners. Uh, both of my heads of supervision on the consumer side and the, and the risk management prudential side are sitting at the table. And uh, they talk to the examiners all the time. We had about um, 550 examiners here in this auditorium last week in two different sessions where we talked about a number of things. And I came to address both crowds. I'm doing a nationwide listening tour and, and meeting with my examination staff in, in a lot of the country, a lot of the st states and, and different offices uh, throughout the country. And uh, the truth of the matter is, you know, you have to reach all the people, and, and they're all individuals. Uh, but we do have uh, rigorous protocols in place. We put them through testing. Um, we bring them here for training at least uh, once a year uh, on different topics. We have internal webinars and compliance manuals that they have to they have to go through to learn how to exactly think through these issues. And then if there is a if there is a question that um, cannot be solved at a regional level, that question usually comes up to to Washington and um, the, the the our heads of supervision here, and they will bring it to my attention and say, hey, this is kind of what the bank is thinking, and, and we're not sure about this product, and we'll try to do a little bit more of a deeper dive at, at a DC level. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I think we may be out of time, unless we have one more question. Aaron, do you have a question? <laughs> All right, I'm not begging for a question. I'm just saying if you want it, you can have it. Uh, at least I have you out there. Again, Jackson Wilson, the Milton Institute, I'd be interested in um, read a couple of FDIC reports, OCC reports, setting annual versus perspectives. I can forget exactly what the, what the titles are. But um, you know, you mentioned a lot about the concerns uh, among the consolidation in the total five space to a number of banks. And what we've been hearing, at least from a number of banks that we've spoken to, is that this consolidation uh, is actually hurting banks' ability to innovate. So I'd be interested in kind of if you've heard those reactions from some of your uh, FDIC members, and uh, if you guys are, are thinking about uh, doing anything in that space. And did you say consolidation um, among banks, or what kind of consolidation are you the, talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, it's, it's true. And here's, uh, it, consolidation in general is happening. So people ask me all the time, you know, we're losing small banks. 
um, you know, if you take a look at the chart, how many we had, and we're down down now to about 5,400 and, and, and a change. Uh, consolidation is happening both at the banks and the core processors. And I think this is where you have some of the fintechs stepping in and uh, taking advantage of, um, of, of, of that consolidation. Um, and for us, from the regulatory side, you know, we know the core processors, the, the main core processors rather well. We examine them in, in some form. Um, and, and, and now we need to be open to actually allowing new entrants into the marketplace and just adjusting our regulatory framework to better be able to, to um, understand the new entrants and uh, encourage innovation and competition in that space. Because I think in the end, small banks can benefit from more competition in that space as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, that I will uh, let you go to the better part of the conference in my uh, presentation here today. And thank you, truly thank you all for being here. This has been a phenomenal feedback. Uh, from, uh, from the public and uh, both on, on the regulatory side and, and outside here. And it's, it's a pleasure to have you here and thank you for coming very much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take just a brief break, about 10 minutes or so, and let the next panel set up. But we'll start at 1.45, which is on time. So just stretch your legs and uh, come back soon. <laughs>